Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all very much. Um, may I first of all thank the three keynote speakers of this morning. Mr. Pochari once again opening our eyes with the compelling facts. A very strong factual statement uh, that is uh, opening eyes for many years all over the world. Mr. De Boer that sketched the huge challenge that we face on our road to a new post-Kyoto regime. And Mr. Imanen that has challenged us to seize this opportunity uh, for change. These were all very strong opening statements. And the meaning of this panel is to really have a lively discussion and interaction between the industry uh, sector, the energy, and uh, the policy makers. I think these three issues are the, uh, really the three main challenges. Energy, uh, industry, innovation, uh, and uh, policy. We're looking forward to a lively discussion, so I once again incentivize all the members of the panel to interact lively, to comment, to criticize where possible and uh, needed. Let me just make a very sh a short statement to start uh, the discussion. The need to save energy is often communicated. The fear that one day fossil fuel reserves will dry up and the fact that the world economy relies too heavily on a limited number of oil supplying nations. These days, this fear is not just being felt by policy makers and by people from the industry. Every citizen feels the rising prices of fuel. And they're saying that this challenge, the awareness of this challenge ahead, is now perhaps bigger than ever before. Our Dutch government has set itself ambitious targets. 30% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 as compared to 1990, 2% energy saving per year, 20% renewable energy as uh, uh, part of the total energy mix. We're also working on a range of policy, me policy measures that should save considerable amounts of energy and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. There is just one I would shortly like to point out. Uh, we are going to change the fixed taxes for road uh, transport both trucks and uh, private cars, we're going to change them into a tax per driven kilometer on all roads. And we are going to make a differentiation in this tax. It will be cheaper for carbon dioxide friendly cars. It will be more expensive for unfriendly cars that produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And I think the main challenge in this, as we saw last year in our discussion in Sofia, is to keep public support. And uh, what we try to do in order to obtain this is not to raise taxes. It's just a mere differentiation in which you really incentivize people to make the right choice. That will be also the cheap choice. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to tell too much about national policy incentives. We are here because we realize that if you really want to fight a, a, a global warming, you have to do it globally. We have to take steps together. That is the aim of the International Transport Forum. Let us, uh, let us really uh, uh, stimulate each other in passing on ideas. Let us see what works and what we could do together. I do agree with Minister Tiefense that opened this morning in saying that of course we should push for strict emission standards in the European Union. But he put on the question on the table, shouldn't we have some emission standards globally? Shouldn't we broaden it up? shouldn't we go further in this respect. Also we have to discuss whether maritime shipping and aviation should be included in the post-Kyoto climate regime, something we believe in strongly. But ladies and gentlemen, with all these measures we have to remain realistic. In the future the world will run more and more out of oil. This will pose us for enormous technological challenges. Conventional energy saving tactics may keep us afloat for the immediate future but surely this will not be enough. We must seek completely new directions, and for this to succeed, industry and governments should work together, closer and closer, should really look for a convergence of views on which direction to choose. And this is now really the challenge ahead. Let environment and transport not be opposite to each other. Let all of us look together for ways to make the transport as, uh, itself more environment friendly, we all need transport now, but also in the future, and to make the transport itself greener, 
that is the way ahead. I now would like to pass the floor as a first speaker to Mr. Tanaka. Your organization, Mr. Tanaka, serves as an energy policy advisor to 27 member countries in efforts to ensure reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy for our citizens. Could you explain us more what your view is on the scope and extent of the energy problem for the transport sector? Thank you, Minister. It is most challenging and interesting question, and I'm always agonizing every day to see the oil prices on the, on the, on the board of uh, the NYMEX exchange. But it is interesting because I, at the same time, as you say, the transportation sector must be a solution rather than problem. Energy sector must not be a problem rather than a part of the solution for these global uh, challenges. And uh, of course, it is quite natural that the transportation sector very much concerned about uh, oil uh, security because 60% of world oil is consumed by the transportation sector. Yes, and uh, this $130 per barrel of oil is, is a real serious threat for everybody. And IEA believes that this price level is too high. I ask this question to the energy ministers in Rome do you agree with me that this current rebel is too high? I got the total silence, by the way. <laughs> of course, publicly it's very delicate to, uh, to make uh, their statement, but at the same time, uh, it is quite natural that high prices sometimes help energy efficiency and in investing into the alternative sources. So that there's a mixed feeling about the price level. But price level is definitely determined by the demand and supply. The fundamental is a key. Of course, there are lots of other factors, speculation, geopolitical risk, weakening dollars, but fundamental is the reason or forces to determine the prices. But which side of fundamentals, supply side or demand side, decide really the prices? Which are the driving forces? This is a very interesting question. We had already experienced twice the global oil crisis in 1973, 1979. These two crises were triggered by the disruption of the supply. So supply really drive, drove the uh, let's say price hike and demand declined. Current uh, price hike is not inviting demand slowdown. This is a big difference. This time, somebody is calling this is the third oil crisis, but very different in nature. It is more coming from the emerging economies, a huge interest, a huge demand increase, and this is more or less demand driven, together with limited supply, because thanks to the very relatively low oil prices in 1990s, we forgot about energy efficiency efforts, we forgot about investing in uh, R&D on, on, on technologies, and investment into the new capacity was slowed down. So this is the consequence of, of our, so, so to speak, complacency. But now we think that the future, we have to face more seriously about the issue of demand side, because we are seeing that, yes, supply side, we need more investment and investment. And we believe that until 20, 2030, we have enough uh, reserves or resources underground. The problem is above ground risks. The lack of or shortage of investment, shortage of human capital, shortage of, of uh, everything in, in, in relating to the access to the resources and so forth. So how could we really respond to this new situation is the challenge for everybody, transportation sector, energy sector, environment uh, related people. IEA is now preparing the new publication, so so-called energy technology perspective. We are going to publicize very soon. This is a report to G8 uh, energy ministers as well as G8 summit. There we show the way or scenario to reduce CO2 emission by 50% until 2050. We are recommending 
First option is energy efficiency. This is cost effective. You gained by reducing consumption. So lots of uh, efficiency uh, things here. Transportation sector, fuel efficiency standard, it should be more mandatory, or we should uh, use efficient tires or eco driving. And by doing so, we think that 50% reduction of, of energy intensity or energy uh, efficiency by increasing 50% is possible by 2050 in this sector. That is our strong recommendation for the G8 and IEA governments. Efficiency is the fast solution and very important for the uh, uh, short to the midterm. But in the longer run, there's a big challenge because to reduce 50% of the CO2 emission by 2050, we need much, much more than that. First, we have to decarbonize whole power generation sector. How? Carbon capturing and storage, nuclear power, wind or solar or these renewable technologies, these are the most important and we, we really mo uh, mobilize all these new technologies. But what does it mean for the energy infrastructure? Our calculation in energy technology perspective shows we have to build 55 CCS plants of coal and gas every year. We have to build 32 nuclear reactors every year. We have to build 17,000 windmills every year. We have to build 200 million square meters of solar photovoltaics every year. All together, we need that much investment and commitment of the government to, to do. So, in fact, we need, we need really the huge change of our priorities there. But that's not still enough. The transportation sector comes. Because using these carbon-free electricity, the transportation sector should move into the carbon-free transportation using hydrogen fuel cell or electric vehicle or a combination, plug-in hybrid, or second-generation biofuels. Without the revolutionary change in transportation sector, we cannot achieve this 50% reduction. So as a whole, the cost is huge, but it's possible. And it, the government, private sector, developing countries should do the share. And this is energy revolution. And this is the response of the using country or user side to this balance of fundamentals. We have to drive down the demand. And that, by that way, we have much better future rather than restricted by the supply side. I thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting uh, statement. Let's now go to the world of the oil companies. Uh, Mr. Iacometti, do you share these views on the challenges ahead to the future? And could you perhaps also elaborate how an oil producing company is adapting its business strategies to the changing uh, environment and the changing energy supply related to the transport sector? Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, actually, we totally agree with Mr. Tanaka's observations. We, we have a long-standing uh, cooperation with the IEA. Um, the way we phrase it in, uh, in Shell is we see three hard truths emerging. It's literally about supply not being able to keep up with demand, which is not just growing, but which is accelerating. And that is really a, uh, an enormous challenge in itself. On top of that, the third hard truth is that we have to cope with climate change. And Somehow what I, what I think we are experiencing literally now is that there is an enormous converging, uh, convergence happening. Because on, if, you, if you just think uh, what is happening because of the high oil prices in relation to what it does to transport, there's an enormous uh, pressure on transport on, on, in, uh, in, all, uh, in all ways. Now within Shell, we've, we've also developed our own energy scenarios and it's perhaps good to briefly uh, refer to those. Um, we developed a scenario which is called scramble. That's more or less the world as we know it. Countries scrambling for supply of energy. But we've also developed another one which is called blueprints. And this is a world uh, where there's a lot more cooperation, effective cooperation between industry, government, foundations, NGOs. And 
what is quite dramatic is that our CEO, for the first time in, in Shell's history of making scenarios, which is, has been done for about 35 years, that he, uh, whilst in the past we used scenarios just to test our business strategies, is your business strategy robust in one or two or three different scenarios. This time uh, we made a very explicit plea that only the blueprint scenarios, that's a scenario where you cooperate, is really results in an acceptable future. Because in the scrambled scenario, you will probably exceed CO2 levels beyond 650, so it's an unacceptable world. Um, the way we are actually operating in this, in this new world is that we are cooperating uh, big time, and I will come back on, on a number of uh, um, f alternative fuels that we are working, uh, that we are developing, but in that sense, for instance, we are cooperating with Airbus on synthetic fuels. Likewise with VW, uh, Toyota, Daimler Chrysler on the automotive side. So we are um, cooperating increasingly, but I feel that a very big step change is required. And in that sense, I think that this forum has an, an incredibly important role to play for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps Mr. Anders would like to comment on this cooperation. I can, I can just confirm that, that we are cooperating with Shell, with uh, other partners, with Rolls-Royce uh, on uh, alternative fuels. We've just recently, a couple of weeks ago, flown a A380 from uh, the UK to London with uh, alternative uh, fuel, gas to liquid in that case, not entirely. We had one engine running, uh, but that's the start of a longer experimentation. Uh, we are experimenting uh, with um, fuel cells as well, fuel cells on board just uh, uh, 100 kilometers from here or less. Uh, we have an exhibition, the uh, ELA aerospace exhibition, where we have an A320 with a fuel cell on board. This is early stages of experimentation, but the fuel cell should eventually replace kerosene in powering the APU, the auxiliary power unit, that uses enormous amounts of kerosene on the runway, on the taxiway, uh, while still standing. Uh, it should uh, replace the uh, electricity generation for hydraulics, for electronics, etc. So we're having a lot of initiatives, and uh, by the way, our competitors and, and partners are all over the place. So the, the aerospace or the aeronautics industry, um, not alone, but with the engine industry, with the uh, fuel industry, with others. Um, I mean, I could go on for hours, but I just wanted to confirm uh, what my colleague from, from Shell has said. Yes, there's, there's a lot happening right there. Excellent, thank you very much. Looking now at this challenge ahead for innovation, and Mr. Tanaka said we should have more investments, uh, more R&D. How can policymakers really come together then with industry and incentivize a fast growth in uh, this direction? Perhaps my uh, colleague could comment on this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's very interesting to hear what the industry and, uh, of course, also the oil producing companies think about these questions because we are definitely dependent on the cooperation with both the industry and, uh, and the oil industry uh, if we are going to make good results. I don't think politicians can manage this on our own. But as politicians, we do have a responsibility both for making strict targets uh, for the future. We also have the responsibility to try and make people see that maybe we have to change our lifestyles. Uh, maybe we have to change our consumption patterns in the rich part of the world. Uh, I agree. There will, I think there will be enough fuel in the years to come, but the, it will be very expensive. I have, we have to make ourselves comfortable with that thought. It will be expensive. And it is, I think it's, um, I must say, uh, if we really want to meet this challenge that we are discussing here today, we might have to discuss, are we willing to reduce the economic growth worldwide? And that's very, uh, of course, a very complicated question because uh, there are different countries, there are developed countries, and there are countries that, of course, need to uh, increase their economic growth, uh, essentially, uh, for, for the future. Um, uh, we don't uh, have time to discuss that in uh, its uh, uh, 
the realities may be here in this forum today, but I think that's essential that we also take that discussion. Uh, for the coming years, we have to make steps toward the carbon neutral society. Uh, and we, as politicians, have to also make steps that, where we use both carrot and sticks. Uh, London was mentioned earlier today. I think what they've done in London is, very, is a very good example. Well, it's not, it might not be popular, but people will see it's necessary uh, to do something to stop the growth in transport. The transport growth is, of course, very much linked to the economic growth. Uh, and we also have to discuss whether we need to transport, for example, food worldwide. Would it be proper to see too that each country can produce more food for the inhabitants so they don't have to transport, for example, food uh, all over the world? It's, of course, also connected to the economic growth and how we want our society and our global society uh, to... Uh, to um, expire in the years to come. Um, we have to have effective carbon price signals, was said earlier by Mr. Pashari. I think it's, uh, that's right. We have to face that and we have to be open about it. Uh, so together with new technology, uh, new kinds of uh, fuel, biofuel, uh, especially second generation of biofuel, the hydrogen society that will come, but I think is maybe 20 years ahead. Um, there are, of course, an optimistic, we can have an optimistic view on this, but it all depends on us as politicians, our willingness to take decisions that might not be popular in the short term, but very <coughs> necessary on the long term. Thank you very much. Uh, Perhaps it's good to elaborate a little bit further on these, on these biofuels, because that is an issue that is often mentioned in the uh, political chambers, but you see that many countries are struggling with the question, how can we really stimulate this? And where will it lead to? And how fast will it lead to something? Uh, perhaps, Mr. Giacometti, you could elaborate a little bit uh, further uh, on this. Do you consider that the introduction of biofuels can really play an important role, also in the not-so-long term? And how do you... Uh, uh, evaluate the balance between the positive sides of promoting the use of biofuels against some negative sides uh, uh, related to uh, uh, food uh, production, but also, if you think about Brazil and other countries, the risk of deforestation? Well, it's a, your question is spot on. It's a very difficult one. Um, however, we are uh, very much in the process uh, of addressing that, and that in, in that way, the industry is again cooperating uh, with foundations, NGOs, and academia. Um, the way one should go about it is what one really needs, and we are in the process of, of working with a number of entities to achieve that, is one needs a world, a global standard to develop biofuels in a totally responsible way. And you have to look at it in a really holistic side. You have to look at all the elements uh, of it. So including land use, change, societal uh, impacts, etc., etc. Um, as you said already, um, a shift towards second generation biofuels is extremely important. We are active on what we call biomass to liquids and actually we're working together with the, uh, the government of Germany and Corinne. So, um, on, uh, on the other hand, if you, uh, you think on the ethanol side, which is for, for petrol cars, we, we are working with Iogen, this is a second generation biofuel which makes use of the waste. Well, what, what I would, uh, however, uh, like to emphasize, we should be extremely realistic about it, how much can be manufactured by when? Uh, that's a really critical question. We should be extremely realistic. What can be done in the next five years? And then one almost is forced to come back to the observation that Mr. Tanaka already made, is that we have to focus uh, enormously on, say, demand reduction, so energy efficiency and energy conservation. Uh, it might uh, be, it might require a total shift in mindset, as earlier speakers were saying. Thank you very much. Perhaps it's interesting if the uh, car industry uh, could uh, step in here. Perhaps Mr. Hordak would like to comment. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, I do agree with the previous speaker uh, that uh, we need to develop the second generation biofuels. We need to have global standards. Uh, we have to have sustainability criteria. Uh, we have just made a statement that all our cars by 2010 
will be able to drive on E10 and B7, and we will go to uh, higher blends in 2015 later on, so the industry is working on it. Uh, I also agree with the previous uh, statements that we need to develop uh, alternative sources of energy. Uh, and for the car industry, you see that um, most of the company are, companies are today working on developing electrical cars, plug and drive. Uh, the, um, the technologies are absolutely outstanding. You just go to some of the motor shows and you see what each of the manufacturers is doing. I think what is extremely important also is to stress the problem of the demand and supply. Uh, we have been working too much today, until today, on the supply side. We have to concentrate on the demand. Um, the Dutch example about uh, with the taxation is one of them. Uh, it can be developed further. Uh, we need to work on taxation. We need to make absolutely sure uh, that uh, it is not the ownership of the car, uh, it is the use of the car. Uh, if you have a big car in the garage, it doesn't pollute. If you drive with a small car around uh, 100,000 kilometers a year, it does pollute. So we absolutely have to work on that. Uh, and going back to the um, opening statement of uh, Minister Tiefensee, we need global solutions. Uh, it doesn't help that we have clean fuels going back to fuels here in Europe. We need to have clean fuels in China. We need to have clean fuels in India. Uh, we have technologies uh, that uh, we have cars and trucks that run today uh, basically with the zero emissions. Uh, I'm talking about NOx, I'm talking about PM. But if we don't have the fuels, and we don't have the fuels in China and, and India, it does not help. So we have to look back on something which we call the integrated solution. Uh, the, the oil industry, the car industry, the drivers and the public authorities all have to come to the table. Thank you very much, Mr. Hodak. We will come later uh, on, we will come back to, in fact, uh, this global nature of the challenge uh, uh, that was also mentioned at the beginning of uh, this uh, ITF venue by Mr. Tiefensee, as you stated. Uh, looking now uh, at the other side of the issue, we, we were talking about uh, um, the supply of new uh, fuels. On the other hand, we also have the innovation in terms of energy efficiency. That is also, of course, as was stated, a very important challenge. I was waking up this morning in my hotel here in Leipzig, just uh, switching the channels, and I saw a, a big program on one of the German channels about environment. It was a rather um, negative setting, uh, really all the um, figures showing the amount of carbon dioxide, and also Mr. Anders showing how much the aviation amounts to this total uh, production of carbon dioxide. The slowly of the, the big gross figures of the aviation, etc. There is, of course, also another reality. Uh, since the aviation industry is investing a lot in fuel efficiency and has achieved uh, quite something in this, perhaps you could elaborate on what you did achieve going from generation to generation of aircraft and how you see this fuel efficiency developing into the future. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I have not seen this uh, feature this morning, but uh, I can imagine what it was about, but uh, let's go to the facts. I mean, the aviation industry, or the worldwide air travel, contributes to something like 2% right now of man-made CO2. With no mitigating actions and looking at the growth, the tremendous growth that we are projecting, at least for 2025, 2030, that could grow to 3% of the man-made CO2 in 2030 or, or 50. I don't know exactly what it is. Having said that, I don't say, okay, we are so such a minor contributor that we, we don't have to do anything. I just uh, a minute ago alluded uh, that we are researching in alternative fuels, etc. But let us remind that in the aviation industry, efficiency and less emissions are going hand in hand. I mean, since the early 70s, we have produced aircraft that are emitting 70%, roughly 70% uh, less uh, carbon dioxide than... Um, you know, 35 years ago. And that was without the debate about uh, global warming, climate change. That was sheer efficiency because we have a tough competition out there between the airlines and uh, fuel costs are roughly today 30%, 40% of the entire cost of an airline. So that's enormous. In the mid-80s, the average kerosene consumption per passenger per 100 kilometers, that is how we, we calculate that, was... Uh, about uh, eight liters. It's now down to something like five liters, and the 380 is below three liters. 
2.9 liters per passenger per 100 kilometers. So there's an enormous um, you know, progress that we have achieved, but nevertheless, we think uh, we need to do more. But as somebody said before, it's not just, let's not focus on just one element, technology, um, engine efficiency, fuel efficiency, aerodynamics are important, that's technology. But emissions in the aviation industry are part of a wider problem that uh, pertains also to infrastructure, for instance. We have in Europe, let's, let's point that out, a very inefficient air travel, um, air traffic management. Unlike in the United States, where we have one operating system, we have dozens in Europe. We are fully, f totally fragmented, more or less than along national borderlines. Now we've calculated if we really had a single European sky, <coughs> and that is uh, kicking the ball towards the politicians, obviously, and it's something we are claiming since 50 years almost, single European sky, because it would be enormously efficient we could reduce the emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, per flight by at least 10%. There's one figure for Lufthansa, since we are in Germany. Lufthansa calculates that their aircraft daily, being on holding patterns in Germany alone, burn so much fuel that they could, they could fuel in 10 or 11 flights between Frankfurt and New York City if they didn't have that holding pattern issue. That is just Lufthansa, that is just Germany. So there's an enormous task here to have an efficient air travel management that can enormously then reduce the emission of aircraft. We have developed in the International Air Transport Association, IATA, what we call a four-pillar strategy. The first one is indeed focusing on technology, on better aerodynamics, on uh, alternative uh, fuels. By the way, we calculate that uh, not before 2000, 30, roughly 30% 30 of the kerosene demand could be replaced by second generation biomass. So it's not happening today. In the meantime, we have other possibilities like synthetic fuels, etc. There are possibilities there. The second pillar is what I just alluded to, a more efficient infrastructure. And I don't know. I mean, the aviation industry in Europe is despairing about that. Why politicians are unable to get that underway? There are some initiatives, but it's, it's crawling, it's, it's, it's moving very, very uh, slowly. Then operational measures, better, better routes, I mean, depends on where you fly, which altitude you fly, etc. That indeed is then related also to navigation technology, something we are also developing with our partners. And then the fourth pillar, economic instruments, if that is unavoidable, emission trading, inclusion in emission trading. But as my colleague uh, to the left has just said, but if that is something that aviation should be subjected to, to in addition to all the other burdens that the airlines have to carry, loading to the, to the high kerosene price we have right now, then it should be fair and global. If we confine that just to Europe, just to a couple of countries in Europe, we should better think about the effects in competition that such distortion would bring. So that is something, and the, the effects, the outcome of that might be something all of us would uh, perhaps not like. I stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anders. And uh, I started uh, with you because I do agree that um, it's very clear that the aviation industry feels in its pocket financially very much uh, uh, the fuel efficiency or lack of fuel efficiency uh, of its aircrafts. It's also now shown with American Airlines that has problems, partly because uh, the fleet is not that uh, fuel uh, efficient. Um, I had to think back about a discussion we had under the German presidency in Brussels, where we were discussing the same issue. Is it a challenge or is it a competitive advantage or not when you run ahead in fuel efficiency? We were discussing that uh, related to the automobile industry. We had a discussion with uh, a member of the board of uh, Daimler Chrysler then still, uh, the president of Total. And the discussion was, some policy makers were saying, can't you raise uh, the, the, uh, uh, the level higher, the minimum standards? You often state that perhaps we could do more. Could we and should we? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a competitive advantage. I come back to it. Uh, maybe we should start by uh, getting back to what the car is. Uh, the car started by being a fantastic tool. The, uh, best friend of the human being because it helps individual transportation. Uh, unfortunately, today the situation has changed and it's becoming the enemy public number one in many towns 
many towns are uh, setting up tolls or uh, congestion charges. Uh, the, uh, should I say, the, uh, the situation, the answer seems to be in our hands. But the number of cars is not going to reduce. I remember that when I was young, I was living in a suburb that had very, very poor public transportation. And the day when I had my first car, my, change, my life has changed. Similarly, you realize that in India, in China, as soon as someone can economically afford it, someone buys a car, because it's a change in the life of individual. Now, this being said, as I said, we have the choice. Either it stays the best friend or it becomes enemy public, because in towns, this is not acceptable anymore to have this kind of pollution. What are these solutions? Obviously, technical solutions, behavior solutions, logistic solutions, and regulation. Uh, in terms of uh, behavior to start with, and I live in Paris, I've been amazingly pleased to see these bicycles in Paris. You know that now for just a few euros a day, you can uh, have a bicycle, leave it wherever you want, take it where you want, leave it where you want, and it's obviously a very nice way of uh, transportation. Simu simultaneously, we know as well that public transportation is very adequate for most of what we do. Secondly, uh, in terms of logistic, we have to note, and thank you for what you've said, uh, we have to note that the logistic that we have worldwide is very, very poor, and this is true for center of towns, this is true for suburbs, and this is true for the aircraft industry as well. So we need, obviously, to be working on a better uh, cross-fertilization of our needs. Uh, and now I come to your point, which is about technology. It is clear today that technologically, yes, the 40 to 50 percent is feasible. And uh, I know that, however, this has a high cost. And the question is, is this cost affordable in a world where you have cars which are so expensive for the individual, but at the same time, there is such a huge overcapacity, probably between 15 and 20 million cars equivalent of overcapacity in today's world, which make that the competition between car manufacturers is fierce. Now, and I want to leave that to you. If you were with your family this weekend, to pick up a car in a dealership. And if you have this car, which costs 2,000 more, and is greener, maybe by 10 to 15%, and you have this other car, and you are with your children, and your daughter likes the CD because she likes music, and your son says, Dad, we never had the leather in the car. Do you think you're going to get out with the Renault car, or do you think you're going to get out with the leather and the CD player? You well know the answer, I suppose. And this is this paradigm which we have. The, the problem is not the technology. We need, however, to sustain strong R&D, and I suggest that public uh, and private R&D are mixed together in sustainable programs, as opposed to change every three or four years our attitude toward fuel cell, toward electricity, toward biofuels, and so on. We need to be more uh, thinking of long-lasting programs, on the one hand. On the other hand, in terms of powertrain efficiency, let me just phrase something with you. And thank you very much for what you've said about aircraft. It's exactly the same. Do you know what is the pollution that comes from cars which are stopped, which are idling? It's absolutely amazing. I'm talking about tens and tens of millions of CO2 per year. We've just made the calculation that in France, if cars were equipped with start-stop start, system, meaning a system that just stops the engine when the car uh, is at a red light or at a stop sign. We would save four million tons per year, just in France. This is massive. How much does it take? A few hundred euros per car. But it's a change in the behavior of car drivers as well that is equally needed. So technologies, for many of them, are there not to get to the 50% that you have mentioned, but I think 20 to 40%, according to the kind of car, is very well possible. You have better uh, uh, air conditioning system today, uh, more expensive, obviously. You have better engine cooling, regulatory uh, regulation of the uh, temperature of the engine system, and so on and so forth. 
The question is an economic question, and the question is how do we solve this issue? I strongly believe that if regulation comes in force, it levels off. It's a fair competition. But if some car manufacturers only do it and others don't, I truly believe that they will not have the economic benefit of the efforts which they have done, which is why I personally think that regulation is important, plus value as a supplier is obviously ready to help all our clients pass the exam. Thank you very much, Monsieur Morin. Um, there's an interesting uh, statement you make. You say, first of all, that uh, further reductions uh, are possible and could be strong, 20 to 40 percent, uh, you mentioned. Second, you say we need further regulation. Going back to the car industry, uh, Mr. Hodak, uh, would you agree that further regulation is necessary? And how would you comment on the statement that is often at the table in political uh, uh, discussions? Isn't it a competitive advantage when the emission standards are raised in a European context, since the first movers, the European car industry, will then secure its own market? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, do we need a new regulation? Uh, we don't have a regulation. We are just talking about it. Uh, so we need to have a correct regulation uh, and we have to have a level playing field. I think it's extremely important what has been said. Uh, and the level playing field cannot be only in Europe. It has to be also with the outside competitors. Uh, I'm going back to the global problem. Uh, we have no problem with regulation. We have never said anything against regulation. Uh, we just need to have a respect of the lead time, of the nature of the industry, uh, and of the fact that some of these uh, technologies that we have been discussing are extremely costly. Uh, if you make the cars unaffordable, uh, then the consumer is going to keep the old car with all the negative consequences for environment uh, and uh, for safety. So we have to make absolutely sure that all, in all this the cars will stay uh, affordable. Uh, we are investing heavily in new technologies. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, plug and drive electrical cars, uh, uh, hydro cars powered by hydrogen are coming and are coming very quickly. In the meantime, we need the alternative fuels uh, and um, we need to, uh, to work on all these things together with the suppliers and, and uh, everybody else. We have to make absolutely sure that we don't go too far, uh, that we are really make uh, absolutely clear uh, that we do not destroy the industry. We need to keep the industry, but the industry does not want to be the problem. The industry wants to be part of the solution. And I think that industry is the part of the solution. We have demonstrated uh, the whole thing. Uh, and um, I believe that um, the whole question of the integrated approach, uh, where you have, and uh, you have said it uh, for the aviation industry, it's exactly the same. We need traffic management. We need proper traffic management. As you need it up there, we need it on the road. Uh, we need to drive it. We need to have eco-driving uh, eco the driver's behavior. We can save enormous uh, amount of CO2 uh, by uh, teaching people how to proper drive. And obviously, first of all, the industry is part of the solution with new technologies and other issues. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Hodak. It's a slow, slightly different view about uh, uh, whether or not uh, to, to um, uh, make even stronger uh, policies. But I think a concording view uh, uh, in terms of the importance of further innovation uh, uh, in the respect of fuel efficiency uh, and uh, also perhaps new sources of fuel. Um, to, go, to go further on on this, because it was mentioned by many speakers, more R&D is needed, uh, more investment is needed. Perhaps, Mr. Jacometti, you could come in on this. How can we, being policymakers and industry together, work more efficiently uh, uh, in a combined way uh, to get the changes at hand in a fast way? Um, and maybe I can give you some examples. We've been uh, cooperating with the government of Japan, for instance. Likewise, in, in Germany, with uh, Nordrhein-Westphalia, we work with the, the Minister of Economic Affairs, where we are doing joint studies on what are, if you talk about road transport, for instance, what are the options for the future? What are the costs related to it? When could we expect certain options to come up? How do you stimulate it? It is literally, you have to take a very hard-nosed approach here. You really have to bring together the experts. You have to do a real reality check on it. What can be achieved by when? 
what's the low hanging fruit, so to speak, and what are the longer term, let me call it dreams. So it's, it's, it's literally bringing together the right representatives from government, industry, academia are very important in this as well, and, and foundations. So it, it's, it's a matter of bringing this together, and I think in, in quite an urgent manner. We, we, uh, time is not on our side, as one of my colleagues said in the past. It's a very strong uh, appeal you're making there. Um, going back to the uh, policy uh, side of the uh, issue, um, um, thinking back of the statement um, that you made uh, uh, just now about being, having to be courageous and also doing things that in the short term are not so important, how would you see uh, the balance, Mrs. Navasate, between uh, promoting R&D, on the other hand, setting high, higher emission standards, taking tough measures? Um, I don't think, um, I think these are too, too much of the same, uh, the same question. I think we have to, uh, to have stronger regulations and to uh, make measures for, for the emissions targets for how, and also agree on how to reach these targets because, of course, that's a challenge. It's very easy for politicians to make targets. The difficult thing is when we start to uh, discuss how to reach them. Uh, and I'm very much convinced that uh, new technology is one of the key factors for reaching our targets, uh, whether it uh, goes on uh, uh, the uh, engines, whether it goes on the fuel, new fuel. Uh, so we have to cooperate with the industry, but I also think that we as politicians have to make some restrictions because, uh, regulations, excuse me, because if we do, then the industry, of course, will, uh, will uh, adapt this regulation and, and change the decision in the right direction. Um, and that's, uh, of course, a challenge because uh, if we only, if we in Norway do that, well, it won't matter much. We're a small country with few people. It's important enough, and we, of course, have to do our part. If Europe does it, well, it will mean something more, but even that won't be enough. In this matter, we have to think globally, uh, because, uh, for example, the car industry is global, and uh, we have to make regulations that uh, the industry all over the world must take into account when they make their plans for how they are going to uh, produce the cars for the years to come. Uh, and of course also the same goes for the oil industry. There is also, um, I will also comment on what's said about, yes we have already done a lot of research and development. I think it's also a major a task to implement the results from the research and development into the society, into the everyday lives of people. Um, and, uh, to, uh, and I also think that we as politicians could, uh, must discuss how we can make incentives that, um, that make people in their everyday life make the right choices. Um, for example, how can we make public transport so attractive that people choose public transporting because it's more convenient, it's uh, make the everyday life easier. Uh, how can we, uh, on the other hand, uh, ha make tax systems that uh, make incentives for people not to use the car so often? It's very interesting what the, the Dutch government is doing in, in that respect. Um, so, uh, to, uh, if I uh, make this a bit shorter, we have to work on a broad scale. And in what we do, in all decisions we make, we must try to sit around a table, politicians and industry, and of course, the people working on, on research and development. But we, as politicians, must know that our responsibility is to make targets and to take popular and unpopular decisions that will make both people in the everyday life and industry uh, to make the right decisions. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Navasate. Um, talking about this mix of policy approaches, um, we can also talk about approaches that are efficient, approaches that are not so efficient. 
that perhaps communicate nicely but don't achieve many results. Mr. Anders, could I provoke you in making some uh, strong statements from your position in this respect? I'm not sure you're going to provoke me, but um, what you trigger in me is uh, to, um, to, to talk about the, the joint efforts that are underway between the governments, the EU and uh, the aviation industry, particularly in, in Europe. Um, I think it's worth noting we have um, started a program called Clean Skies last year. That is a program that is 50% funded by the European Union and 50% funded by industry, by the aircraft manufacturers, by the engine manufacturers, etc. It's a program of 1.7 billion euro. So this is, this is uh, you know, not pocket money. And from that you can see that the aviation industry is not just, you know, holding their hands and say, governments, please provide for the money. We are investing a lot of money into that. Uh, I have in my company uh, research and technology only research and technology, not research and development, which is far more, 500 million per euros per annum. And we, we figure that roughly 80% of that money spent is, is direct or indirectly related to environmentally friendly uh, technologies, uh, fewer fuel consumption, etc., etc. When we talk about regulations, I do not rule out, obviously, that regulations are necessary, but let's talk also about incentives. Um, and it's interesting, some airports have started to put charges, different charges, on, on the airlines when they land. As you know, the, the uh, aviation infrastructure is, uh, is, is not paid for by, by the governments. The aviation infrastructure is paid for, uh, for through charges. So um, airports have started to put higher charges on planes that are more polluting. Now, these are not necessarily, some, some got it wrong, these are not necessarily the bigger aircraft, because the bigger aircraft, like the 380, have much more you know, passengers on board, and hence you have to calculate what it means in terms of per passenger. You know? But that means that you have, in addition, you could say to a high kerosene price, an additional incentive to go for modern, more fuel-efficient aircraft. We have in the world, we gather at least 3,500 old-generation aircraft. It's a heavy fuel-consuming, heavy polluting. Now, these are the aircraft that the the airlines are now retiring first, of course. Most of them, by the way, are in the US. And interestingly enough, but not surprisingly, the most modern aircraft are in the growing uh, markets, in the new markets, in Asia, in China, in India, because they order aircraft, they get the, the present generation aircraft. So these aircraft are far less polluting than those that are in the established markets, so to say. So just to make the point that one should also think about additional incentives rather than uh, regulations, additional taxes, emission trading, etc. And again, in our industry, and I guess same in the car industry, I mean, uh, to a certain extent at least, it is, uh, it's nicely converging. Lower cost means also lower emissions, particularly at a kerosene price that high. But let me say to the kerosene price, I mean, some, some here might be happy about it and say, okay, the oil price, uh, that means that the, the incentives are much stronger uh, for going to new technologies, but there comes a point where obviously then uh, entire sectors, traffic sectors can collapse. If you go over a certain point, we're talking about $200 uh, a barrel, I do not see which airline can afford this. We'll see massive collapse of this, uh, of this traffic branch at least, so that's, uh, that's a risk here. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I saw that Mr. Hordak also would like to come in. Uh, yes, first of all, I, I fully support this dialogue between uh, the legislator and the industry. We have to have it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, that the legislature basically dictates to the industry what the industry should do without the consultation with the industry. We have it in the European Union, we have it, but I think it can be improved. Uh, to be a little bit provocative, um, we have been talking about taxation. Uh, we believe very strongly that uh, CO2-related taxation, both for fuels and cars, uh, would solve lots of the problems which we have today. But this taxation has to be harmonized across the European Union. Now, when you tell this to some of the governments, namely the UK government, the Danish government, and other governments that are the most environmentally proactive governments, they refuse this. Uh, I think that we should uh, also look at this possibility uh, and when we are talking about uh, lowering CO2 emissions, uh, solving the environmental problems, 
uh, the car industry is doing their part, but we believe uh, that the legislator also should put a little bit uh, water into their wine and look at certain issues that have been taboo today. Uh, if we would have CO2-related taxation across the European Union that is harmonized, it would solve a lot. Uh, and uh, I wonder if uh, from the legislator side uh, we can have a, a response to this, uh, to this interesting problem. Uh, that response will come, but I saw that Mr. Tanaka, from his uh, point of view, also wants to add something. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really agree that uh, you know, the government certainly has a very important role. One, to make market works, providing enough, uh, let's say, uh, structure or design that uh, the price uh, mechanism or price message delivers to the, to the consumers. For that, some of the countries using the price control of petroleum or subsidizing some of the petroleums in, in developing countries, this is not good because that certainly gives incentives of a more wasteful use of energy. So that should be gone. But at the same time, to make a new technologies possible and implement it, as uh, Minister of Norway said, we need good design of the market, or incentive system, so to speak, or fuel efficiency standard sometimes. These are the very important elements of the government policies which should be uh, constructed, uh, in a sense, consistently, and making uh, the full, uh, let's say, effect as a different components. Without consistency in the system, you make a very different and uh, misleading uh, messages to the producers and consumers. So certainly, as, as not only individual country, European-wide system is necessary, maybe global system is necessary. This is a very big challenge for the governments, but when we think about, for example, uh, IA is prescribing the very importance of the renewable energy as an energy source, but a renewable energy cannot uh, develop from the, big, uh, from, the, uh, from the ground as it is. Simply, we need some sometimes subsidies for preliminary uh, stage, and then moving toward when it's getting more and more matured, we come to the more, let's say, uh, market-oriented uh, devices or, or, or like, uh, let's say, uh, green certificate. So how to design depending on the technology, depending on uh, the, what's the, uh, the, uh, the stage of this maturity should be well integrated into the government policy. Otherwise, we will make a mistake. And government should make a very stable policy because usually we need a huge investment in energy infrastructure and nobody can invest. The nuclear is a very touchy policy in Germany, but if gov government changes policy on and off from time to time, how could private sector invest huge amount of money into the infrastructure? So how can you, the government, a politician, make energy policy stable or environment policy stable? That is probably most important to make the things happen. Thank you very much, Tanik uh, Mr. Tanaka. I, um, if I may respond as being one of the so-called policy people, um, I think that you're absolutely right, that there needs to be consistency in the system. And I think that everybody that stated here this morning that we need to have a more and more global approach is um, absolutely right. Uh, but that is why I think we should have the courage to really be as uh, um, um, ambitious as possible in setting high emission standards all over the European Union. Because I strongly do believe that at the end of the day it is a competitive advantage, because cars coming from outside of the Union that are not adapted to that, they won't enter our market. It can be a win if you're a first mover. Of course, it would be even better, as Mr. Tiefense said, if we find a way to make it a more and more global approach. And I'm not negative in this respect. I think at the end of the day, more and more countries will want to be a leader. And there are already some striking examples uh, far from uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, second, I think that, um, of course, you will always have front runners. What we are doing now in the Netherlands to taxate every car and every truck for every kilometer has not been shown anywhere else, and we still have to show it. We are working on it. Um, but I must say that even there, we try to work together as much as possible. With the trucks, we learned from the example of Germany, that was a front runner there. We work closely together with France and Belgium to try to make it a joint uh, approach. Uh, and with cars, we also try to stimulate other people, come and watch our plans, 
come and look at the system that we are building up. Um, there is one critical remark I would like to make here, and that's a fear I have personally. We as politicians should never abuse the environment issue to taxate people stronger and use that money for other issues than environment. I think that's a very big risk, and it's so easy for politicians to say we taxate. No, you have to show that you use it for the environment. And that is why we are so critical in our new tolling system. We make the kilometers cheaper for carbon dioxide friendly cars. We make them more expensive for carbon dioxide unfriendly cars. At the end of the day, we earn nothing more or nothing less. And I think that is very important to keep the public support. Uh, we are now coming also looking at the, at the hour, uh, slowly to a um, round of uh, closing statements. I would like to invite uh, everybody uh, uh, to make this statement. And I would just like to put into the group, um, uh, before this last round, one uh, big question I have uh, myself, also rethinking the uh, statement of Mr. Uh, Anders. Uh, indeed, the global challenge is very much important with the car industry, uh, but also with the aviation. We are, uh, uh, of course, incentivating without tariffs uh, environment-friendly planes uh, to be cheaper in Europe from wherever they come. But how can we now incentivize other countries, if you talk about emission trading, to join the system? In other words, how can we prevent that the aviation gets more expensive in Europe and that the hubs are more and more in the Middle East or further if you think about the fact that the Dubai city airport has five parallel runaways, it will have 150 million passengers' capacity. How can we really incentivize other nations uh, to join? That is, that is uh, one worry that I have. I would now like to perhaps give you then first the floor for the closing statement. Well, again, a deliberate provocation from the, from the chairman. You will not make me say anything negative about uh, Dubai or their airlines or the Middle East. They are a major customer of ours. Uh, <laughs> That's not a purpose, but I'm coming back to what I said earlier, like my, my colleagues from the, from the car industry. Uh, if you want to include aviation into, into emission trading schemes, make it global. I mean, that's the answer. I know it's, it's difficult. The second thing is, think about incentives before you think about additional taxes and stuff. I gave a few examples where incentives um, uh, make a lot of sense. Third point. Yes, we very much count on technology and innovation. There's a lot the industry is doing. There's a lot that industry can do together with governments, with research institutes, etc. And here I gave also an example uh, of something we put a lot of hope on. Uh, the, the Clean Skies Initiative. Initiative sounds like it's not very serious. It's a, it's a major project with 1.7 billion euros. I'd like to, like to repeat that. Then, if it comes to infrastructure, I have to kick that ball once again, because it's so easy that, that politicians ignore that and say, let's talk about taxes, like, let's talk about emission trading and all that kind of stuff, and really seriously start implementing the single European sky. I mentioned what that would mean in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, in, in terms of less pollution, in terms of saving fuel, and uh, emissionless uh, flying. Uh, we, we, we see very little moving here, and uh, I would like to really incentivize the political rep responsibles here today to take that uh, serious before we pick on aviation and say, see these guys with their contrails, they are the big polluter, etc. And uh, fourthly, then, um, the operational measures which I mentioned, but which, which are very much uh, airline specific. How can we fly in the most efficient way? Altitudes, flight routes, etc. And that very much ties on with um, the, um, the infrastructure question. Just to remind that, uh, I mean, this, this industry, like the car industry today, is a very, very global industry. And damaging that industry that today, for instance, transports roughly 40% of all goods in terms of value, go through aviation in terms of value, not in terms of, of volume, that is obviously on the ships. Um, that particularly emerging countries, Poorer countries would suffer, I think, disproportionate if we have a really, uh, you know, breakdown of the aviation sector. And so that sounds very dramatic, but uh, since you invited me and provoked me, this is my concluding word. Thank you. It's nice discussing with you, Mr. Anders. Thank you very much. And the political point of the single European sky is taken.
that's a very important issue uh, indeed. Mr. Hordak, perhaps you would like to give your closing recommendations for the way ahead. Uh, well, uh, I think we all agree on, uh, on the need uh, to have incentives uh, for innovation for R&D. Uh, we don't have to discuss it further. Um, what the industry has been doing uh, over the last years and what it's going to do, uh, it's, I believe, uh, a very good example uh, how we can develop more fuel-efficient vehicles and contribute to the solution of the, uh, of the problem. What we need from the politicians uh, are not targets, are long-term targets. Uh, it's not enough that we are talking about 2012, 2015. We have to talk in realistic terms uh, about 2020, 2030, 2040 and 2050. So we need for the industry long-term targets. We are global industry as much as the aviation industry is and we need global solutions. Uh, I don't believe that uh, the solution is to be found just in the European Union. We do need uh, absolutely uh, a global solution. Uh, last uh, but not least, and maybe first, we need absolutely the integrated approach. Uh, we need uh, that uh, the infrastructure comes to the table, that we have investment in infrastructure. Uh, we need investment uh, and we need uh, to have uh, alternative fuels. Um, going back to the infrastructure, when we are developing electrical cars and hydrogen cars, somehow the hydrogen has to be distributed and stored. Somehow the electricity has to be distributed. Somehow I have to be able to recharge the car. Uh, so we have to start working on the infrastructure because we are working uh, on the technologies. So it is a two-way street. It is not a one-way street. Thank you very much, Mr. Hordak. Uh, Mr. Tanaka. Thank you. Uh, only point as an international organization like IEA, uh, the need for data or need for information where we can build on our analysis and policy recommendation. I think Ibo Debor told us about the need for data from more developing countries. Biggest uncertainty in our projection in World Energy Outlook is how long China and India are continuing their economic growth. Economic growth issue was touched upon the Norwegian minister, I remember. And that makes a huge difference in the oil demand of our projection. But we don't know really uh, the data availability in, 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 for example, inventory in these countries. Without knowing inventory, we cannot project demand properly. So how can we get more good data, not only in these countries, but for example, for the resources or uh, reserves underground from uh, oil producing countries? These are the big uncertainties we have to face with. There's some other data we need, that is from the private sector, just as you are. We are providing the energy efficiency index or indicators, which we are asked by Grand Eagle Summit in G8. This gives us a very interesting idea of potential savings in the future. That means potential uh, reduction of the CO2 also. But the private sector is providing us data, but some of them consider that by providing us more data, you could be penalized in the future. So we don't have enough data. But without data, our analysis is not perfect. And our recommendation to the member governments is imperfect, and that leads to the wrong decision. So facts, data, information, and objective analysis, that's the role of our international organizations, and let us please use us in the right way and in the correct way with good data inside. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Iacometti. Let me just reiterate that uh, energy security and climate change present a huge challenge to humanity, and I think we have a real big sense of urgency around this. Um, as Professor Himanen already indicated, essentially it's a leadership challenge. So that's why I want to come back to uh, my plea that the cooperation between government, industry, academia, foundations is absolutely essential. I would be very happy to contribute to this, a real case for action as soon as possible. And if I may be provocative, let's use the next ITF forum to review progress as well as to share best practices. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sharing best practices, I think, is also one of the main issues of the Inter uh, International Transfer Forum, looking at uh, Secretary General. Uh, that was also what we stated last year when we started this new road. So I think that was 
uh, very well uh, placed. Monsieur Morin. Thank you very much. Well, as it seems to be fashion to be provocative, uh, I think that many solutions will come from outside the industries. We in the industry very often are just too close from our work to see how we can create breakthroughs. And I just would like here to take an, exa an example that happened in the uh, electricity, uh, electrical cars. Uh, the problem of electrical cars is one, the autonomy, and second, the uh, uh, charging time. Obviously, if you want to drive 400 kilometers and after 300 kilometers, the car tell you six hours or 12 hours of recharging time, uh, you just can't afford it. And there comes this change of the business model that comes from outside our industry, from someone who was working in the data processing industry that says, okay, I'm going to create servicing points all over the place, and when you arrive with your car, I'll change, uh, I will exchange your empty battery against a full battery and out of a sudden the business model is changing entirely. I don't mean that it will be satisfying in all points, but I mean that certainly there is a roadblock that disappears just by changing something that has absolutely nothing to see with technology or with the automotive industry. I think probably in all our businesses there are possibilities and we need to listen more maybe to people outside our industry. Thank you very much and thank you for your a year-long incentive to, to really keep the discussion going on about what's possible with tele, uh, technology uh, innovation. Thank you very much, Monsieur Moret. I'm looking at my Norwegian colleague. Perhaps you make the last uh, political statement. Thank you. Um, we are discussing a, a global challenge today, and of course, it needs global solutions. Uh, but there's, I don't know, and I don't think there is time enough to wait for global, um, for us to agree on global solution on a short term. That's why I think it's very important what's done, for, for instance, in, uh, in the Dutch uh, government, in uh, the UK and other countries, uh, to try out also uh, different solutions on the national standard uh, and be a good practices. The gravity of the problem requires tough political actions. In my view, a stick and carrot approach is necessary. Government and uh, politicians uh, all over the world both have to make environmental good behavior attractive by incentives, by for instance massive development of public transport or cutting taxes on zero emission cars, and at the same time make environmentally bad behavior less attractive by for instance increasing taxes on high emission vehicles, introducing congestion charging, in the cities or redu reducing parking avail uh, ability. availability. Sorry. Uh, I think that without a wide set of action, including some tough ones and an integrated approach, emissions from transport will continue to grow and we can't allow that. Uh, we will have to make the emission trading scheme global and include aviation and shipping into the system. Uh, we will need both short and long-term targets, and we will need cooperation uh, of governments, of industry, of research institutes in this very important work. The climate change is the main challenge for our society. There is no time to lose. We need action now, and as politicians, and here in this uh, setting, as transport politicians, we have to set, put ourselves together and decide that we're going to do something about it. Because what was said earlier today, it's five past 12. And I want to stop by the um, saying of Mr. Gandhi, as was also said earlier this morning, be the change you want to see in the world. And as politicians, we have got the responsibility to be leaders. This leadership will have to make us cooperate, even though it might be difficult and hard, but with our children and grandchildren are gonna face the same fantastic environment that we can experience. We need action now. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Navarsate. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think this was um, 
quite an interesting discussion. Uh, many views were exchanged from the three sides uh, of, the, of the issue, the technology, the industry and uh, the policy.